Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, can you hear okay? Is that good on it? All right. I got to make sure that I start this timer. Um, so it really is an honor to be here. I started this project some time ago, um, and the Montana Historical Society has been fantastic. I was actually born in Helena, and it's really fun going actually through the museum as many times as possible. And as I'm upstairs researching and getting to go by the albino, you know, buffalo is always fun for me. I remember um, that very well. And it is such an honor in, in many, many respects also for uh, Kirby to have arranged this, for Tammy to be kind of the instigator of this. And of course, I am so grateful to uh, Dr. Pallister. It's been fantastic getting to know you and your work. And I just touched the tip of the iceberg, particularly of his memoirs, which are upstairs in the reading room. And I highly recommend that you read them or when Josh gets them out, right, um, for everybody. Um, I want uh, to dedicate this talk to Dr. Ron Losey, good friend, terrific colleague, one um, who has done amazing things for medicine in Montana and actually all over with his knee surgeries, was instrumental in helping so many patients at the Boulder Institution with Pallister. And I'll talk about him a little bit later. But Dr. Losey, um, as he says, is a goner. Um, that's how he wrote it. Um, he passed away on May 14th, um, but I just think unbelievable, and I really want to dedicate uh, this talk to him, as well as Dr. Pallister and their amazing friendship. And I'll return to him a little bit later. Um, my parents can't be here tonight, but I was born in Helena. And uh, they met Dr. Pallister in 1958, when they took their firstborn, Jan, over to see Dr. Pallister to have a confirmation of a diagnosis of Hurler's disease, which is a rare genetic um, condition in which she didn't have an enzyme to process complex sugars. Um, my parents, you know, waffled on, did we institutionalize her or not? And there was a nursery that was constructed at Boulder in 1962, could have placed her there, but ended up keeping her at home, and they're so grateful they did. Um, she gave immeasurably to our lives in so many respects. And uh, only lived till she was seven, but it instigated in my parents um, the cry to do something for not only their daughter, but for others. And they did a talk show across Montana in the 1960s through the home demonstration, women's groups, um, through the Montana Extension Service, and uh, got involved in the Montana Association for Retarded Children. Um, I won't go into that, but I just want you to know a little bit of how, you know, we, I got involved in this. And um, also to say this story is part of a larger story. So let me introduce the star. Um, for a number of you, you don't actually need an introduction. I know that you know him, that you know of his amazing work. Um, and yet, at the same time, I think it's really good to go back and look at what he's contributed to Montana and really internationally. Um, as you look at this, he is a general practitioner, and he likes to be called that, a GP. Um, he definitely is one that treated patients in Boulder as well as the, clin uh, the individuals at the institution. Um, he it became a research and clinical geneticist so along the way, and I'm going to tell that story, named some 14 different genetic disorders. Um, at least, uh, published well over 30 articles. In fact, one that just came out a couple years ago, still talking, still doing amazing things. Um, held genetic seminars, seminars in Boulder, later at Choder. Uh, the orthopedic program that he started with LOCI helped individuals in all kinds of ways. He worked with the legislature, championing all kinds of things. Um, that I'll get into, push newborn testing laws, instrumental in ending forced sterilization. You can see the list goes on. And if it's not enough, just covering some of the things that he did as far as genetics are concerned. Um, he was also mayor of Boulder for three times you were elected. Um, was working on the school board as a member, brought clean water and sanitation to the town, actually moved to Boulder because of the great fishing, became a great hunter and fisherman. Um, a trapper, gardener, cattle breeder now, as one individual calls him, he's a renaissance man in all kinds of ways. Um, so I want to set this story um, in a little bit larger context, and that is that 
Um, it is situated within the history of Montana's care and treatment of people with disabilities, which actually is as old as the state is. And a clouds and rainbows over Boulder, I think, captures it. This is a photo actually taken by Willie Pallister, um, Dr. Pallister's wife, who um, I think captures in some respects that it is an institution that um, was plagued with abuse and problems and staff shortages, even some of the things that you read now about the Montana Development Center, there are all kinds of problems that plagued institutions across the country. And yet at the same time, it was also a place where, you know, a number of individuals wanted to care for people in all kinds of ways and try and make life better for them. In ways it is like other institutions, in other ways, it's quite unique, and I think the reason that it was very unique is because of Pallister and the genetics work that he did there. Moreover, Pallister became a social activist in many ways, contending that all his patients have rights and work towards that. So this story is set within two revolutions, I think, in broader 20th century American and even international kind of context. One is medical, that I'm going to focus on today, and one is social. And so certainly it is a story of genetics and the power of genetic knowledge and how that shaped and changed and transformed what we know um, that in affects medicine today and how we understand people. But the genetic story intersects with the social story, and it's important to see the links. The medical model of of uh, disabilities, the ways that we understand a person medically, um, intersects with the way that we see individuals socially and who we are and what this community is and how do we understand difference and how do we as a society treat people with disabilities. How we understand and care for people with disabilities has undergone a radical transformation. In some respects, we might look at some of those changes just as remarkably as what has happened in genetics. Hence, I situate this story about disability rights also within the broader story of civil rights and human rights, about who we include in the community and how we think about diversity, how we think about values, how we treat each other. So the other context is very much genetics. And we have seen unbelievable changes um, in that. New knowledge and discoveries throughout the 20th century. Um, tell us a lot about genes. Those instruction manuals, as Dr. Francis Collins calls them, instruction manuals for life. Scientists have mapped the human genome today um, that helps us treat disease. You can actually have your entire genome sequenced, right, for about $1,000 or even less today. And it can reveal if we have a particular mutation that makes us prone to developing diabetes, or as Angelina Jolie told us a few years, if we have, or we're prone to breast cancer, it's revolutionized medicine in all kinds of ways and led to some uneasy ethical dilemmas, obviously, as well. So the road to this genetics um, revolution was paved by numerous individuals, uh, from Austrians like the Austrian monk like Gregor Mendel, who crossed and recrossed peas, trying to figure out um, a little bit more of how things worked. And then we get Watson and Crick um, that we all know as being able to discover the structure of DNA. But it also has roots in Boulder and with clinical geneticists or the general practitioner, Pallister. And today, probably a lot of you know, especially if you've had a baby, that one of the first things that we do within 24 hours is to test that individual to see is there any abnormality, is there something that we need to diagnose. Hypothyroidism, for example, um, detected early, especially that early, can prevent debilitating cons complications. Pallister actually championed hyperthyroidism tests in the early 60s. Um, that was really remarkable for changing a number of individuals' lives. But in 1947, when Pallister came to Boulder, he didn't know about a lot of this. Um, he did not have these, this information at his fingertips. No one did. So to set the stage for before what was going on at the institution, and I just want to highlight a little of that history and then go into what it is 
um, that he saw when he came in 47. Montana, like I said, established um, the care and treatment for people with disabilities early at statehood. In 1893, the School for the Deaf, Blind, and Feeble-Minded, so-called feeble-minded, by legislative mandate came in 1893. And it was part of a large state-run custodial institution that began with the educational objectives but quickly morphed into a dark, dilapidated, in many respects, dungeons of shame. The state replicated feeble-minded programs in the East and in the Midwest, except it placed those with cognitive dis disabilities in Boulder with those that, had, that were deaf, blind, um, put it under the same care and management. This didn't work very well in all kinds of ways. Um, by this time, the nation's experiment in educating those with intel intellectual disabilities had failed. When students, the deaf and blind, moved to a stately new home, um, the, actually, I went too fast on that, didn't I? This is it. Um, when they moved into a new home, the feeble-minded did not. In fact, those with intellectual disabilities were diagnosed by doctors and sent to Warm Springs instead of moving into this building. Immediate segregation by the um, people that were running the institution. By 1913, though, um, they did build, by 1905, they built a new building, and by 1913, there were 79 that were living on the south side, south campus of the campus. And uh, here's a bridge that goes over the Boulder River de de, uh, showing the separation and the Department of the Feeble-Minded from the main campus. Segregating this population, however, didn't prevent bullying or painful encounters. In fact, Archie Randalls is an individual who was um, deaf, who was there in the 1920s, and his uh, recollections are upstairs in the archives. And he describes the feeble-minded as pests and mental defectives and complaining that the ever-increasing, nay doubling, of backward children was irritating and mental torture. And in the 1930s, he was one that lobbied for, successfully, for the move of the School for the Deaf and Blind to Great Falls. So people argued um, that segregating these individuals was necessary. It was important. Feeble-minded boys, a Montana training school superintendent said in 1912, was necessary because these boys became criminals or the victims of criminals inclined. Girls became outcasts in society who bring more of their kind into existence. A 1919 Montana survey of the state's so-called idiot, imbecile, and moron population documented cases to illustrate the need for control. Many felt that these individuals were childish and irresponsible, too low grade to do any work of value. They were dangerous and hopeless. So segregation seemed to be the answer. Put them in custodial institutions, away from society. Sterilization offered another solution. On the national stage, psychologist and eugenicist Henry Goddard contended that individuals with a low IQ were a menace to society, a drain on the social welfare. Get them off the streets. Improve humanity with selective breeding. Sound familiar? A little like eugenics? On the national, um, or Helena woman, though, echoed these same sentiments. In 1924, she wrote a letter to the editor saying, I am a taxpayer. That means I wish for no insane, no feeble-minded, and no criminals to support and to fear. The very fact that these people are inmates of state institutions, it proves that they are morally or mentally unfit to propagate their kind. So beginning with Indiana, in 1907, 32 states passed eugenics laws um, and sterilization. The Supreme Court in 1927, in a famous case, affirmed the constitutionality of these 
laws. That included Montana's law, which was passed in 1923. In talks given around the states, the state training school superintendent, it was a, as it was called at the time in Boulder, Howard Griffin, reiterated the logic of the Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes' statement, who argued that eugenics, in eugenics, that three generations of imbeciles are enough. And with that, eugenics really hit hard here in the United States, as well as in Montana. And this chart kind of shows a little bit of some of what happened during uh, so-called President Griffin is what they were called at the time. So we're, Superintendent Griffin, um, the uh, numbers went sky high. Griffin declared that the feeble-minded, inept, and incompetent fell into three categories, the helpless and hopeless, the manual workers, and the misfits. And all he contended should be incarcerated for life and controlled. So when he came in 1930, the state had sterilized around 35. By the time he left in 49, the numbers reached 250. The peak years were between 1938 and 40. So by the time that Pallister arrives in 1947, the training school had largely been neglected. Certainly financially, it was hard, hard hit, not facing very good appropriations at all, especially during the hard economic times of the Great Depression and World War II. It suffered from inadequate funding and space, untrained staff, abuse, insufficient supplies, and very little public concern. The training school held a wide variety of individuals labeled at the time, and this, the language of, you know, how do we call our friends, how do we call people with disabilities, how, how do we refer to people like my sister, um, and the, the names and the terms have gone all over the place, obviously taking on a really negative connotation as time goes by. And you also write about this in your memoirs. But the training school held a wide variety of individuals labeled at the time as feeble-minded, retarded, mentally deficient, low-grade, degenerate, and crippled. And it shows some of how people thought about them. Psychologists actually diagnosed them as idiots, imbeciles, and morons. And uh, most at the training school had cognitive disabilities, but some were able-bodied, some had distorted limbs, some endured paralysis, seizures, and other complications. Many residents had disorders and diseases caused by a variety of problems, including enzyme shortages, birth defects, lead and alcohol poisonings, illnesses, and accidents, accidents causing them. Well, the doctor had very little training in 1947 to encounter this world. At 27, and only three years out of medical school from the University of, Wis of Minnesota, and a short stint in the Army, he was drawn actually to the Boulder area because of fishing, and really only planned to send, spend a few years, but luckily, he stayed. He arrived in the Boulder Valley a bit nervous, he said, and I quote, the thought of all those nonverbal patients with strange and disfiguring conditions, paralysis, twisted bodies, convulsing, incontinent and sick, it made me quite nervous. How little we all knew back in the 40s. He thought at most, as most people did at the time, as most doctors, that all intellectual disabilities stemmed from an enzyme short a defect. He said there was an abyss of knowledge, and he was ashamed that the medical community largely viewed and treated this population as subhuman. Well, doctors reflected the social um, norms of the time, and these views actually furthered state negligence. Thinking about the ways that those with disabilities were hustled away from their home and communities in shame and silence, and the shame upon the the parents of people with disabilities, housed in ill-equipped and deplorable conditions, it gives us pause today. These Montana citizens were not given high priority in budget allocations or care. So here's, uh, I like this picture of Boulder, especially for some of you from Boulder. Uh, 
It was about a population of 500 in the town and 500 at the institution in 1947 when he came. An aerial shot of it. The newspaper announced a new doctor in town, which is great. Pallister wrote about what he saw. Patients live 50 to a room. Big rooms, mind you, but still 50. A few walked around naked on floors smeared with feces. They drank from communal buckets. Laundry was done twice weekly, and that meant that residents frequently slept in soiled sheets. They died from diseases and infections, as well as from bathtub drownings, burns they incurred from exposed pipes and abuse. Patients performed chores in the cottages and on the farm for 10 to 12 hours a day, seven days a week. Some, Pallister said, faked illness just to get a day of rest, wouldn't you? In comparison with other state institutions for the physically disabled in the nation, Pallister said that Montana had the third lowest expenditure rate per capita. But for Pallister, all of them were his patients. They fell ill with colds just like everybody else. They got measles. They got infections. And all were his patients, he said. These gloomy conditions Pallister encountered in Boulder deeply disturbed him. On the evening of December 7, 1947, just a few months after he arrived, he was summoned to the training school, to the hospital that they had, um, to see a girl with measles. The attendant told him that the ambulance was on its way to the school hospital from Cottage 4, which is just a fancy word for dormitory. After waiting for some time, he descended the stairs to peer out into the darkness and the swirling snow. And finally, he said, here it came, materializing out of the night. Pallister recalled, two girls, one a mongoloid, with the, which is an anachronistic name used for Down syndrome, um, two girls were pulling and snorting on the tongue of a child's wagon and two more pushing the best that they could on the rear of the box. The ambulance was a kid's wagon with an enlarged bed and the patient was very dead and quite frozen. As indicated by the child's wagon, serving as an ambulance, the institution had very little to supply the doctor. The makeshift two-story hospital um, had, a, had a surgery, a small surgery room up on the upper floor. And you can see the stairs going up to the surgery room where mostly it was uh, um, sterilizations that were performed there. The screens, Pallister said, leaked insects in droves. We usually detailed one to slaughter the invaders. A small closet sufficed as a laboratory, though it housed no lab in it. It was simply a place to collect blood and urine samples that were sent to Helena for analysis. The staff, too, had little to prepare or to offer Dr. Pallister. They had little to no medical training, and their protocol appalled him. Pallister said his brain literally shifted out of gear when he saw a sick call. A line of boys all dressed in overalls, all with bowl haircuts, took turns announcing their complaints. I have a headache. I have a side ache. And to each, the same cure. The department head, who had no nursing expertise or training, dipped a sponge into a small stainless steel bowl half filled with the bright red mercury-laced antiseptic called merthiolate and rubbed the spot. Next. I can see why your head, you know, literally shifted out of gear. The new doctor threatened to resign, the first of many times, when he witnessed this pseudo practice. He demanded sterile techniques and the end to shooing away sickness with a dab of red. All should have regular checkups, temperature checks. If temperature, if patients had a fever over 101, Pallister ordered assistants to send them to him, and under his guidance, the institution went radical alterations, acquiring medical um, equipment, hiring additional medical staff that was trained, implementing basic hygienic care. This led 
as you might well imagine, to a dramatic decrease in tuberculosis, measles, pneumonia, and overall death rates. There's one haunting story that got me the first time I read the uh, memoirs, and I have to share it, um, and many probably have heard this, but um, this death of Laura is something that affected Dr. Pallister as well, and I think it's really important in capturing some of what was going on that he witnessed. Uh, it was a harsh, record-setting cold winter of 1949, just a couple years after he had arrived. And writing years later, Dr. Pallister described Laura's death as the beginnings of his activism. It sprung, he said, from what he thought was failing enough to stand up for Laura. Laura was born with a rare um, recessive form of microcephaly, very small head. Laura had few of the capabilities and attributes that we take for granted. Like many in her situation, she had no way to speak for herself. That night in February 1949, Laura grew agitated in one of the cottages. She screamed and she cried, irritating the night watchwoman who took out a belt and beat her. When the cottage attendant came in for her shift the next day, Laura was out cold. So she immediately called Dr. Pallister, who examined her, recording what he found. Her neck was rigid, he noted, and her tiny head twisted to one side. Her right pupil was fixed and dilated, showing no reaction to light. The left eye responded sluggishly, ugly black and blue, blue bruises, and red bloody belt marks covered her. She was dying from acute brain damage, he concluded. The day attendant actually reported to Pallister that the night watch had told her she was screaming and hollering and I beat her until I was ashamed of myself. The doctor called the school's administrator, Howard Griffin still, and demanded an autopsy. A butte pathologist ruled that Laura had been beaten to death. This riled Griffin, who just wanted the whole thing silenced, he was about ready to retire and he didn't want any political brouhaha. The county attorney agreed, and they were going to let it go, but that was the last thing that Pallister was going to do. Outraged, he took off for Helena, went to the attorney general, Arnold Olson at the time, who then sent word back to the county attorney and said, you will investigate. By this time, however, the night watchwoman denied beating, and so did the attendant deny hearing of it. Instead, they claimed that the girl had fallen in the bathtub. The day attend Griffin shouted, well, someone has to be responsible, and the county attorney promised that there would be an inquiry and no one was to leave the state. But Boulder has a train, <laughs> and leave the state was precisely what happened. Instead of a trial, a night train whisked away both women to Grafton, North Dakota, to another institution for people with disabilities, where Griffin had arranged jobs. And that was that, right, for all except the doctor. The administration and local authorities were unwilling to prosecute the homicide and the abuser was free. Laura's relatives probably never heard about this. Maybe they did, but it was common. And you can imagine in this age of shame that it's really hard in many respects to have a child with disabilities. Some left the, their children um, and went home and placed an obituary notice in the paper. We don't know ha what happened with Laura. But she served as a catalyst for Pallister. The memory of her bolstered him to challenge the establishment, not whitewash ever anything. And the first lesson that he learned out of this, he says, is go to the autopsy table for the truth, for the causes of retardation. Laura's autopsy had revealed that her brain had not atrophied as the official death register recorded. Instead, her em since her embryonic days, her development was flawed. Portions of her brain were absent and, the, and malformed. The second lesson, he said, is find out what the cause of death is. Determine it. Don't guess. Laura's developmental problems did not cause her death, as actually was recorded in the death register. Instead, it was the beating. 
So autopsies became that first uh, crucial bit of information and side of knowledge that the doctor um, started pursuing. What happened with my patients? Why um, are they facing such debilitating situations? He said, bear in mind that a good many of our patients were unable to think, to talk, think, point, or whatever. We were often dependent on physical and laboratory findings alone for a diagnosis. All of this masked by cripplings, twisted, spastic, or paralyzed and wasted bodies. One patient, he recalled, had an electrolyte imbalance, and he thought that the patient died because of it. But upon opening the skull, he found multiple brain abscesses due to poor dental hygiene. The patient had not been able to communicate the pain and had gone untreated. Later, you brought in all kinds of dentists to help treat so there wouldn't be that kind of problem. Pallister said he began to come to his senses. He declared we had to start treating them as human beings. And this falls within a larger story about you know, what was happening across the nation at the time. Um, I won't go into it, but certainly the Kennedy family, parents of uh, children with retardation were organizing, and they too were saying, we have to start treating them as human beings. At the same time, Dr. Pallister became very interested in genetics. This started with a really high rate of epileptic seizures that he noticed at um, the training school. And I've just tried to capture a little bit in this slide of some of the, your journey through it. It only touches, you know, a little bit of what happens with it, but you can see up at the top the autopsies. Then he sees these seizures and epilepsy, and he's going, what's going on with that, and how do I stop the seizures? How can I make life better for my patients? And he ends up starting an e getting an EEG um, uh, to measure the seizures, goes to Seattle to learn how to read them. As he's reading the tracings and slowly titrating medicines to be able to stop the seizures, he's also starting to read a really important book by Lionel Penrose out of England, who uh, Pallister and the psychologist that was first hired there start looking at the pictures and going, that looks like my patient, that looks like my, my patient, um, and start getting into genetics in many respects. Um, so in 1955, he develops this. In 1956, it's a really pivotal year in Pallister's life and also in the field of genetics. Only three years earlier, Watson and Crick had discovered the structure of DNA. In 1956, scientists ascertained that human cells contained 46, not, 40, um, not 48 chromosomes as they previously thought. Um, Ivor Foling, a Norwegian physician in 1934, was the first to associate an inborn metabolic disorder with mental retardation, making all kinds of genetic connections. Um, in the 1940s, George Jervis in New York proved that PKU was a recessive condition and other people started working on um, some kind of a diet to remedy the problem. Pallister began attending uh, meetings in genetics around the country, when they went back to in Virginia, um, also took him up to New York. He met Jervis, talked about um, PKU and finding out diagnoses, uh, worked with, uh, went back to Boulder and said, let's find out about our patients here. Do they have PKU? What can we do? Involved a medical student um, who was there at the time and another individual to study all of them. Of the some 650 patients at the hospital at that time, they found 12 cases. The student working there at the time was Miller, who was one of 70 students that eventually traveled to Boulder to work with Pallister and be trained. When he went back to the University of Pennsylvania, he then sent Pallister all kinds of information, you know, some of the cutting edge research. Turns out that having students both helped them and helped Pallister. And this is the beginning of a real scientific hub that is happening at um, Boulder. Additional discoveries in the field of genetics, such as the 1959 finding that Down syndrome um, resulted from a double copy of a chromosome 21, made lab studies even more 
fundamental for diagnosis. And so in 1963, he starts putting in, uh, he starts increasing his lab abilities. Um, by the time that you end in 1975, that lab is seen as one of the most pivotal in the um, Northwest, diagnosing all kinds of different um, conditions. In 1964, Pallister and Miller, as you can see up in that top right, left-hand corner, um, won an award for their exhibit, Chromosomes in Medicine, for the Montana Medical Association, and people came from around the United States to hear a course that these physicians gave. So the lab continues to develop. At the helm of Boulder's lab, between 69 and 74, was John Casey, uh, who held a degree in biology, came from Anaconda, and later served as the head of Shodare, just retired a couple years ago. Pallister sent Casey to Johns Hopkins to get additional training and then to come back and run some 16 different tests, uh, including amino acid checks, thyroid screenings, Casey loved the position. If you ever can talk to him about it, he thought it was the best job, don't tell Shodare, that he ever had um, because he felt like Pallister was on the cutting edge and had built one of the best laboratories in the state. I think he had a lot of fun too. Complementing his growing expertise in genetics and lab analysis, Pallister refined his physical examinations. If you ever have an opportunity to hear him talk about how he does a physical, it's absolutely fascinating. I think, you know, uh, having you recount that would be fantastic. But he talks about how he would begin um, just looking at a survey of the hands, looking at the fingertips, looking at the, the hair, the coarseness of it, the eyes, the teeth, the mouth of the patient, gait, the sound of the voice. I mean, it'd take you like an hour to go through it. What are the abnormalities? What are the normalities? What's going on with this patient? It's really quite fascinating. And of course, learning how to do a physical when you're in training is one thing, another thing to have it refined over the years. And that complemented the labs, the genetics, and led to a number of diagno diagnoses of the disor and disorders. Medical students were central to all of this work. Jean Levin and Bill Levnitz for example, spent the summer of 1965 doing chromosomed karyotypes on school residents. Um, by 1966, they had a whole scope of studies being done here. It was a cutting edge place to work in all kinds of ways. Um, and Pallister was quick to pick up the phone and consult with experts all over. Not only did he bring in students, but he brought in all kinds of medical uh, medical specialists at the in the middle, you see Pallister talking with Opus and Jurgen Hermann, um, who are both renowned geneticists. They came in diagnosing, working with Pallister, and the collaboration the, in the field was phenomenal. Here he is with a number of them. I think we have to acknowledge, too, um, obviously, that it wasn't just about the genetics. It wasn't just about diagnosing a disease. It wasn't just about publishing a great article. But it was about how do we treat and care for these individuals. And LOCI was fundamental to that. Genetics provided what Pallister called the intellectual froth to his work. But he was foremost a clinical general practitioner. And he was concerned about patients in the hospital who could not sleep laying flat, who couldn't feed themselves, who couldn't um, you know, just do basic kinds of things. And so he brought in LOCI, and from 1959 to 1975, they performed life-altering, life-changing surgeries that allowed them to walk, allowed them to feed themselves. When the uh, legislature balked about funding the institution, uh, Losey and Pallister and Margaret Keating, a nurse, paraded patients whom they've treated who once were bedridden, now walked before them, and Pallister says, you still want to cut the program? Losey says, that year at least you got a little bit more in the coffers. On the last day of 1959, this became personal. And uh, so this is at the beginning of the, the surgeries, it's at the beginning of the genetics, but it's something that really changes um, Dr. Pallister and Willie's lives and the family. And that is that son Adam, 1959, is born. Um, 
unbelievably wonderful person who is here today. Um, and um, Adam was, you know, slow to develop. He was their 11th child. He demonstrated multiple developmental and cognitive disabilities, difficulties and struggled to survive. He had a weak cry and was frequently sick, learned to walk at three and said his first words at three and a half. The distraught par parents, of course, sought specialists, had tests run, I'm sure you did physicals, um, revealing that Adam had infantile hypercalcemia caused by a chromosomal disorder. Adam lived at home but went to school at the training school. Now, Pallister found himself in the same camp as parents of his patients. And there he gained a greater appreciation for the social difficulties faced by these individuals. I think having Adam gave Pallister more than book, lab, and clinical knowledge ever could. The experience emboldened him the belief of the human dignity of each person, and it helped him understand and collaborate with other parents. He said, all of us, are, all of our retarded brothers and sisters should be treated with dignity, not as kids, not as second or third class citizens, not as subhuman. All of our institutional citizens are entitled to at least the same standard of care available in private life and should be given as much autonomy as possible. And th with that, he became a proponent of deinstitutionalization, de which began to enjoy a public wider support at the time. Pallister took residents out to vote, got them jobs, helped them in all kinds of ways, changed the sterilization law to make it to, um, against the law to sterilize someone forcefully, requiring patient consent, uh, developed a family living course. Despite Pallister's purposeful focus and benevolent intentions, though, this world was fraught with all kinds of harsh and bitter opposition. And I actually take this from a collection of articles that Pallister put together. He was under attack in all kinds of different ways, as well as Boulder um, was coming under attack in really difficult times. He said there was much and at times bitter controversy at Boulder. Well, the doctor produced no small amount of some of that controversy and uproar. You can imagine beginning with Laura's where he is contesting the powers that be and quarreling with administrators and bureaucrats. He did not stop that. He was raucous at times. He fought for greater appropriations, better care. He wrote letters. He failed to mince words. He gave spicy sound bites to the press. Confrontational, intellectually rigorous, critical of religion and foul-mouthed, has a chapter on that in his memoirs, the doctor both intimidated and yet commanded respect. His tactics sometimes stunned others, but proved effective as when he paraded patients before the legislature, or when he hung pictures of burned patients in his office, burns that they incurred from the open pipes that were in the dorms. One reporter called him a thorn in the side of public officials, he lambasted Governor Tom Judge in 1974 over the lack of skilled emergency care that was available when people went on strike. Political machinations, he says, are going on that are damned intolerable. He cried, insisting that all parties recognize that the retarded and handicapped are the innocent suffers, sufferers. Some cheered, some jeered, some mysteries represented him. And to his critics, Pallister said, they don't see the tears on my pillows at night. Despite Pallister's personal commitment, his, his public advocacy and significant medical establishments and some of the changes that happened at the institution, it was all too much in the 1970s. The institution remained uh, plagued by problems. The 1970s was tumultuous as there was significant overcrowding, a high turnover of administrators, one after another, and employees, sanitation problems, outbreaks of disease, labor strikes and lawsuits, and patient assaults, rapes, accidental deaths. I know you probably have followed some of what's gone on with the Montana Deve Developmental Center. I think it's 
important to know this long history. As a result, the Montana League of Women Voters issued an alarming report in 1971 identifying the Boulder River School and Hospital as the state's most distressing public institution. In 1972, it fails to receive accreditation. Uh, eventually, the federal government moves in with a Department of Justice lawsuit, which Pallister celebrates. Somehow, there needs to be some change. At the same time, um, the journalists are spreading all kinds of um, news about it. The Great Falls Tribune, even as early as 1967, talks about the tragedy of our institutions, and 1970s become a time of deinstitutionalization. Superintendent Keith McCarty publicly scorned the place as a dumping ground for the unwanted. He said one dormitory held over 100 severely and profoundly retarded males at the same time one 14-year-old girl, year girl was not even disabled, but was rather there because she kept getting kicked out of foster homes. 175 residents were held in shackles, and the place was unbelievably dehumanizing. Well, Pallister II was under attack. In 1969, a legislative audit charged that the doctor was overpaid, to which he said he was well worth it. <laughs> I agree. But... That didn't stop an investigation from criticizing what he and Losey were doing for experimental surgeries, they said. They didn't have orthopedic licenses. In many respects, what they wanted to do was reduce the cost, deinstitutionalize. It was all too much, and Losey ended up quitting, and Pallister, both pushed out and fed up, resigned at the end of 1975. Residents, too, at this time were rapidly leaving Boulder River School and Hospital and group homes were there. In 1985, it became the Montana Developmental Center. In 1976, Pallister did not, he retired from Boulder, but he did not quit genetics, not quit his work. In fact, he took his lab to Chaudaire. And actually, we owe a great deal for that because now they have one of the best cutting edge labs in the Northwest as well. Opitz joined him in 1979, and they established an esteemed program. Pallister now is celebrated, won numerous, numerous awards, um, a meritorious service to handicapped children from the Montana Council on Exceptional Children, honorary degrees from Montana State University, and honorary um, positions across the United States. In the 1970s, he organized ethical moral seminars, which I'm... These are fascinating. I'm not going to go into them anymore, but really dealing with harsh, uh, how, do, how do we handle the ethics? He's now known as the father of clinical genetics in Montana, lives in Boulder, as you well know, at Jaybird Ranch. And I just want to close with a quote that a good friend of both Pallister's and mine, actually a former um, historian professor of mine at Montana State University who's kn who knows Pallister well. When I asked him, this is Pierce Mullen, what he thought of, of Pallister, what his first impressions in an interview I was conducting, he characterized the doctor as vulgar, strong-willed, stubborn, and just an ultimately lovable guy. He went on to say the reality of the institutionalization was upsetting. And when Pallister and Losey went out and talked about it, it was shocking. It was hard. But despite the doctor's rough exterior, Mullen insisted that Phil's contributions have been, first of all, an enormous amount of intelligence and love. He was so determined to make his patients' lives better. This was his first and only his main goal in life. So I want to turn it over to Dr. Pallister with that. Need a gurney. <laughs> <Not yet. laughs> 
Am I on the way of the picture? Uh, things have changed since the last time we did this. Dawson List is sitting in here. Where is he? He did a lot of those autopsies that we're talking about. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm going to say before I read this little thing that uh, I was part of a three-legged stool. Now, uh, any of you guys that ever worked in a dairy farm know why we use a three-legged stool. There's a lot of uneven stuff on the floor. And it takes three legs to keep from tipping over. And that three-legged stool consisted of Bud Little, Amos R. Little, and Ronnie Losey, and me. And we worked as a three-legged stool for years. And he was the guy that put me up with Ron Losey. And Ron Losey, died a couple of weeks ago. <coughs> and Bud Little died a couple of years ago. And I'm sitting on one leg. <coughs> but I want you to know that, that anything I did depends on these other people. All of these great doctors and students who worked with me. So one of those guys that I, <coughs> I worked with was, can you hear me? Yeah. Was uh, Thomas, Tom Hawkins. He was a general practitioner who did everything. And he was my mentor and covered my patients in the hospitals. And I worked with him for 28 years doing surgery in Helena and uh, as much as 80 hours of surgery a month. And <coughs> he backed me up on everything I did, and he encouraged me to do these things. But he's the kind of guy that believed that doctor meant teacher, and you taught your fellows. So uh, I'm going to start by reading this a guy named Heinrich Heine wrote these words in 1822. Ich weiß nicht, was soll das bedeuten, dass ich so traurig bin. Ein Merken aus alten Seiten kommt mir nichts aus dem Sinn. And he's talking about stories from the past coming up and flooding your mind, and the things that make you kind of sad, and thinking of old time things and things like that. It's the opening line to the De Lorelei. If you ever want to hear the whole damn thing, come out the house and I'll do it for you. <laughs> so the, my mind is full of these stories now. And the uh, interpretation that they gave is, I know not if there is a reason why I am so sad at heart a legend of bygone ages haunts me and will not depart. My mind is filled with golden tales. I've been called a lot of things in my life. Some of them are favorable, and some of them not. Uh, <clears throat> I think if you take a vote, I might come off fairly well ahead, but not always. I would like to correct some of those I hear from time to time that have crept into my biography. As far as my professional life, except for honorary titles like adjunct professor of medicine from Bozeman or wherever, uh, doctor of science, HC, professor of pediatrics emeritus from the University of Washington or whatever, I am not a geneticist, a pediatrician, nor a specialist of any kind. I am proudly and unequivocally a general practitioner, 
a GP. I followed the definition of my mentor, Tom Hawkins, of years ago, who when he was an expert witness in a trial was asked by Wellington D. Rankin, and just what is a general practitioner, replied, a specialist in the skin and its contents. <laughs> As a boy, after completing an Eagle Scout physical exam by the Mayo Clinic endocrinologist, Edward Nerson, I said, thanks, Doc and then endured a dressing down by the great man on how impolite and discourteous I was and how it was important to address doctors by their title, et cetera, et cetera. I won't belabor it. My patients have called me Doc all my life, and I treasure the title more than any other except dad, lover, grandpa whiskers, and related endearments. Well, doctor means docere, comes from docere, which is Latin, which means teacher, and said in that way, it is an honor to be so addressed. I admire teachers above all other professions. Back in the days when I was doing everything night and day, there were few veterinarians in the area, and I was often called upon to act as such, and sometimes it involved wild animals. Carl Kyler was working as such, uh, uh, for was working down at acquaintances in the Boulder Valley running a moor during hang season for old Kerry in 1957 when he cut off the right leg of a mule deer, spotted fawn, who bedded down in the tall grass hay meadow. The bleeding had, uh, damn tears. The bleeding had clotted up and he took her up to Arnold Reeder's in the Upper Valley where he hoped to get milk to feed it where he had a milk cow for his kids. One look and Arnold knew it wouldn't live with the mangled bone and the flesh and the dirt. So Dan, his eldest son, met me with Jeff and Greg and my surgical assistants in the office just that evening. Danny was filled with grief. He likes to be called Dan, he doesn't like Danny. <clears throat> uh, carrying the tiny fawn in his arm. Carl cut off the right leg just south of the shoulder with his mower. The fawn was literally shrieking with terror and pain. The boys held it down, filled it with xylocaine. I filled it with xylocaine, reamputated the leg, sawing off the bone up higher to clean tissue and covered the clean remnant with fresh muscle and hide and gave her a slug of penicillin. The fawn was without pain, but she would shriek, a shrill, piercing bleat, look up at us terrified, and pass out, eyes rolled back in terrible fright, her little heart just a humming. Well, it healed nicely. The family and I made a house call three days later. She was well cared for, and she lived in the reader's shelter belt for a long time. A whistle and a cry from Danny, Bernadine! and she would come in long, graceful bounds. But when she walked, her front end would drop down with each of the left front legs quick step. When she ran, you couldn't tell she was short a leg. In cold weather, she'd curl up with her old collie Sandy. I saw her in the meadow from time to time. One day, she crossed up the highway across the ranch and was hit by a car. She was about a year and a half old that November of 58 and maybe headed into the hills to find a mate. She had some broken ribs, not bad, but the patrolman thought Bernie had lost her leg in an accident and he shot her. Too late, he recognized she was a pet. When I see those depictions of aliens in the sci-fi movies working and cutting on humans, their big eyes looking down on their victims, I recall that little fawn's terror. It fits. A young whistling fawn, tender swan they're called now, Cygnus columbianus, had dropped out of a bunch migrating through the Red Rock Refuge about the spring of 52 or 53. It showed up at Reeder's Pond just north of town. The upper part of the back of its right wing was badly hurt the muscles ripped off and the humerus was broken and the right dorsal surface of the left thing was ripped slightly in the same place. Looked like a golden eagle had latched on and ripped the swan's wings but couldn't handle the much larger swan. 
I, I did some uh, loose surgery, splinted the bones, wrapped its wings to its body, and it convalesced in Reader's Pond. It wandered and grazed in the meadow for a couple of months. The gauze binders finally unraveling, and it flapped its wings, and one day it flew away, leaving its bandages with a memory, or so I like to think. Do any of you know what the biologic index is? A reproductive index? It's figured at about 2.3 kids to replace the mother and father. This is a picture of my family in, <laughs> at our 90th <laughs> anniversary. So if any of you uh, got any questions about that, Well, here I am running out of time, so bent that I become a specialist on concrete and painted toenails, and I want you to pay particular attention to Danielle's feet tonight. They're amazing. <laughs> <clears throat> and they have very little to import that's worth a damn, but I'm filled with memories. The legend has it that though swans are mute during the rest of their lives, they sing beautifully and mournfully just before they die. And like my swan, with Linda's magnificent help, I have sung my song, and I'm just going to fly away. Bring the dirty. <laughs>